Good morning, church. I have the wonderful privilege of preaching on this beautiful Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday, wow. Um, we're entering the season of Passion Week that will ultimately res that will ultimately ultimately resolve itself in the salvation of mankind. This is the climax of God's love story. This is the climax of God's, of God's love letter to us because he sent his son, the word become flesh. Jesus is God's love letter to us. And this is the culmination of everything that God has, that God has been working towards. It says in his word that He's the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. And so we come to this point where Jesus is heading to Jerusalem. You'll, you'll notice that so many times when Jesus is performing miracles, so many times when, when Jesus is being celebrated as, as the Messiah, as the Christ, as the prophet, as the next Elijah, the next John the Baptist, everyone's encouraging him. His brothers, his, his earthly brothers and sisters and, and his, uh, his neighbors, they're all encouraging him. Like, if, if you're really the Son of God, if you're really the Messiah, if you're really the Christ, go to Jerusalem. And his answer is, it's not my time yet. He had a work to accomplish in his, minis in his ministry, and, and we, we've come to the end where, where he's finished everything that he has to do, and now the last thing that he has to do is enter the city finally. And um, so that's where we're at. We're... We're going to be reading from Matthew chapter 21, and um, Matthew's, I, I like Matthew's version of the, of the events because it's the most concise. Uh, Mark's version has a little more details, I might allude to them in a little bit, but um, I want to talk about this entry into Jerusalem real quick. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem, and came to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. And the disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the ground, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest! And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Amen. Amen. I want you to notice what, what is happening here. Um, Jesus, as I just read, has just demonstrated that he is the one and only true king of Israel. Now, if you don't know anything about, about world history at this time, Israel is under the is under Rome, Rome control. And there, there is a king in Israel, um, King Herod, who is a placeholder that the Romans set up to give Israel just a nominal king, so that they can feel like they, like you know, that they're they're living up to God's will for their lives and not rebel. Um, however, Herod is not of the line of David. He's not the true king of Israel. Um, He's a placeholder. He's a political person. He's not really... He, he lives a life of sin. Um, we, we hear about him in John the Baptist's ministry. John the Baptist would preach, and, and King Herod would hear him, even though he didn't live according to...
submitted to the word of God. But for some reason, he was he was hungry to hear the word, um, but he wasn't living for God. And he wasn't the true king, and he was just a placeholder. Um, but, but Rome was in control. Uh, Caesar was in control. When Jesus walks into Jerusalem and declares publicly that he is king, it's all, it's all over. It's a wrap. At that point, now, the, the cozy relationship that, that the Jewish leadership had with Rome to have their faith king and to have their own autonomy is now at stake. But Jesus says, no, I am the true king. He comes to the city fulfilling prophecy, riding on a donkey. People literally make a royal carpet for him out of coats and branches. Everyone's excited. Everyone's praising. It, it, all right, so, okay. So Jesus proclaims himself as king. Everyone else is acting like he's king. This is, this is a big deal. Um, but Jesus is fully aware of Friday's events. And he's fully aware of Sunday's events. Amen. Amen. Um, I don't know if you're, if you're getting this. Friday, the crucifixion, he's fully aware. Actually, before this trip to Jerusalem, he was telling his disciples, just a chapter earlier, as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside on the way, and he said to them, See, we are going to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death. And deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. And he will be raised up on the third day. Jesus is fully aware that when he walks into Jerusalem and when he declares himself king over his people, that this is going to end in the crucifixion and this is going to end in the resurrection. Um, I want to talk about, about Jesus as the king and I want to elaborate on different areas of his kingship. And this is not entire, the entire. This is not the entirety of his kingship, but um, they, there's alliteration and they're in the story. So I'm just going to talk about these areas. So um, number one, he is the king of promise. All that to say is that Jesus is fulfilling a promise that that the Lord made, that God made to His people through the Scriptures. Um, so over our lives, Jesus is the king of promise. Now there's all the, there's different types of promises to the Gentiles, promises to the nation of Israel, promises to our families, promises to the church, promises to ourselves. That's they're all in the scripture. Um, and then there's and then we have the prophetic words and, and the gifts of the Spirit where, where God can speak prophetically through a person and speak prophetically to us and give us a prophetic word for the immediate circumstances of our lives and um, what God's given. Um, but I want you to know that Jesus is the King of Promise. Um, notice that he has perfect knowledge of the situation regarding the promises of God. Notice that he says, go to that village over there and you're going to find a donkey that no one's ever rode on and just, you know, just collect that donkey for me. i got to ride this donkey. And the disciples, they don't, really, they're like scratching their heads. They're like, well, Jesus, why do you want a donkey? That's kind of weird. But he says, no, just go over there and get that donkey. And he says, you know, you, somebody might say, hey, what are you doing? Why, why are you taking this donkey? And then just be like, oh, the Lord has need of it. And they'll be like, okay. Um, so Mark's gospel actually explains just that. That they went over there and some people were like, hey, what are you doing with our donkey? And then they were like, the Lord has need of it. He is so perfectly aware of every detail to fulfill the promises in your life. I mean, we're not just talking about donkeys. We're talking about having the right people and the right place at the right time. Um, he is the, he's the king. He's in control of all these circumstances. And when he, when he promises us 
to accomplish something, and when he gives us directions, when we follow those directions, we shouldn't be caught off guard or by surprise because he knows it all. He knows what he's doing. He has every intention of fulfilling um, his promises for us. I think about personally um, in my life, there have been so many times that I've been, that where God has spoken promises over my life, where I would walk into just a spirit-filled church I've never been to. And not once, not twice, not three times, I can't even count how many times that I go into a room totally anonymous where God speaks the same promise over my life. And it's always out of nowhere and unexpectedly. And I, like, it's just so crazy. I mean, and, and I just stand on those promises. I just have to rest on those promises. And, and there have been times where, where you know, I, I don't feel like it's going to happen. I don't feel like, you know, God, you gave me this promise that I was going to be, that I was going to, to preach your word, but it's not happening. You gave me this promise that, that I was going to be a prophet of God, that I was going to, that I was going to reach the lost, but it's not happening, Lord. And I, had, and I struggled in Bible school. I struggled in Bible school with this concept. And I even would tell people, oh, you know, you know maybe it's just not going to work out. And they'd be like, oh, well, maybe, maybe it's not going to work out. You know, may, it, okay, you don't have to be in Bible school. Just go. Just go. And then I, I would return like, wait, wait, what, what, are, what are you doing? Like, what are you saying? Because I had the promises of God ingrained in my brain and in my heart that I, that I actually, I went to someone and I was trying to talk myself out of, of walking in the will of God and and they were, they were like, okay. But, I had, but the promises, because I was standing on them, because I was meditating on them for so long, that even though that this person, you know, even though they meant well, they were enabling me to walk away from that promise. You know, it, the Spirit of God rose up inside me and said, no, you know better than this. And, and I was doubting, but I had to hear somebody else you know, I had to hear the doubts from somebody else's mouth for me to really get it, <laughs> how stupid it was. Um, <laughs> just saying. Um, I don't know what, I don't know, I can't, I can't even begin to just call out everyone's promises in this room. I just, I just know that my God's character, I know that if he's done it for me, that he'll do it for you. I know that um, he's spoken so many promises to me, and I know that he's, he speaks to us. Sometimes uh, if, you're, if you're waiting on God to speak a promise to you, maybe it's, it, maybe it's just you're not making yourself available to hear the promise. Um, for me, it's just spending time in his word. That's when I hear God speak the most. Uh, for me, it's uh, going, going where the word is preached, going to prayer services. That's where I hear God speak to me. If, if you think that God's not giving you any promises, then maybe, maybe you're just not spending enough time in the word or in atmospheres where his word is being spoken, but that's, that's just my two cents. <laughs> so, um, no, but God, God has so many promises for us. There's so many promises in scripture. If, if you're looking for something just to fall back on, I mean, how about God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whomsoever should believe in him would not perish, amen? How about um, we're more than conquerors through Jesus Christ, amen? How about I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me? These are all in the Word. This is for all of us. This is gold. This is money in the bank. Come on, let's go. Um, Jesus is the king of promise. Jesus is, is in charge of all these things, and Jesus will, will fulfill his promise, and that's what he's done here. He's entered the city, and he's declared he's fulfilled that scripture. I don't know if the, if the disciples even realized that Jesus had fulfilled scripture in front of their eyes. It doesn't say that Jesus told them this was to fulfill. Matthew just says that this is to fulfill Scripture. This is to fulfill what the prophet said. Who knows when Jesus revealed this to them? Maybe, maybe it was the Holy Spirit revealing it to him in the moment as he's writing the Scriptures. Maybe Jesus described this situation on the road to Emmaus. 
He's fulfilling scripture in front of them. We have a responsibility to not only collect God's promises for us by, by reaching out, by reaching out to God, by de- digging in his word, by, by spending time in his presence, but we have a responsibility to meditate on his promises, to understand them, to, to seek out just a greater, deeper understanding. So there's so many times, like I told you, that I was doubting in God's promises. So many times, I mean, so many times, even though God told me that Danielle would be my wife, you know, so many times when she wasn't having it, and I, and I would always go back to God, and I'd be like, what crazy idea did you get in my head? What crazy idea did you put in my head, God? Like, if you got to let me know. You got to let me know, is this just in my flesh, or is this, is this really from you? Because it's not really happening right now. You know, and I won't go into all the details of our, of our amazing romance history, but, you know, obviously she's my wife now. Um, but I say that, I say that to say that we have to, we have to seek a deeper understanding when we receive the word of promise. We have to, we have to rest on that word and, and meditate on it. And think about it. You know, when Jesus was, was, uh, was being brought to be dedicated at the temple and, and two people came to deliver a prophetic word over Jesus as, as the baby that Mary was, was taking charge of. And Mary pondered those words in her heart. She, she pondered them. And, you know, they told, they told Mary from when Jesus was a baby that, you know, that it would pierce her own heart. You know, she carried that all the way, and she watched her son be crucified on the cross. That's a tough word. That's a tough promise. And we don't understand all the, all the things that God says to us. And sometimes when God uses a person in the prophetic, you know, the word is passing from God into the heart and mind of that person who is, who is being operating in the gifts. But you need to understand that. You know, the flesh can, can get involved. And so as the hearer of the promise, you, we need to meditate on the words that were given. I ha- actually, I have words in my Bible right now from the last time that Chrissy prophesied over me. I got words in my phone from when Hubie prophesied to my wife. We're just, we're waiting on those promises. We're listening. We're meditating on those promises. And we're, you know, we're dissecting like, okay, how much of this was you know, just in the moment, this, you know, whatever the day was, like, how much of this is flesh and how much of this is, is, is God, you know, just, you know, because they were obedient to deliver that word at that time, you know, and it's not for us to say, you know, anything about that. They, they were obedient and, you know, I applaud them, but it's up to us when we receive a word to test it against the word and to just test it out, walk it out, um, you know, and if it's not of God, then just say thank you, that's it. <laughs> um, but Jesus is the king of promise, and he's going to accomplish all those promises in your life, amen? All right, so I'm just going to keep going on. So it's Palm Sunday. Just a normal Sunday for Jesus, just walking into the city, being decorated with praise and, and celebrated by people of just all kinds of people. And, you know, how was he going to follow that up? So, Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables, the money changers, and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. I want to talk about prayer. Jesus is the king of prayer. Now, he walked into the temple, and there was was all this commotion and all this activity. 
um, people were, you know, you might have heard, you heard the word money changing. So what would happen is that the people, the, the Jewish people at that time, you know, would come to the city, we're getting ready for the, for the Passover actually, because, you know, Passion Week falls on the same time as the Passover. So we have all these people who are going on pilgrimages to, to the temple to give their sacrifices to God. And historically at this time, it just wasn't feasible for everyone to bring um, cattle and, and livestock to, to offer to God. So what they would do is they would bring their, their Roman and their Greek money, but that money wasn't acceptable in the temple. So what they would have to do is then convert that money into an acceptable sacrifice and then they would offer that sacrifice. Now, what is going on on the side is that the, the priest and the Levites and the people in charge of the temple are getting a commission on that transaction. So in order for the people to worship the Lord, now the, the priests are actually adding to their sacrifice to go into their own pockets, so to speak. And not only that, but because real estate was an issue, that they had to use the area of the temple that was designated for the Gentiles to come and worship God. Now, if you don't know, the temple had, has many different sections and I'm not going to, uh, to really get into every single area, but it, it's basically going from, there, there are different levels of intimacy with God, and it goes with the court of the Gentiles, the court of women, the court of men, and the court of priests, and then so forth until this, the, the innermost sanctuary and the Holy of Holies. Now, the leadership in that temple decided, oh, it's just the Gentiles. You know, we can take over that spot and we could, you know, run this, this scam. And Jesus immediately is, 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 he walks into the temple and he sees this activity and it moves him to righteous indignation. And he flips the tables of the money changers and he, he says, get this out of my house. Is not my house supposed to be a house of prayer? So look at all the details. We, ha we have the dishonesty of the money changers. We have the abuse of God's people who now are, are giving their sacrifices to God. And, and I don't know about you, but when I give my sacrifices to God, when I give my tithes and offerings, I feel it. Is anybody else in that? <laughs> anybody else in that boat? <laughs> you know, if if I had to to pay an extra commission on that, I'm I'm gonna feel it a little bit more. That's abusive. Um, not only that is 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 now there's this activity and this commotion and there's this and now we got people probably haggling over over pricing and you know trying all this business activity going on. And so what we're doing now is we're mixing the secular with the sacred. So, so nothing sacred anymore. Um, and, and finally, we, we just, we've completely lost God's heart for the nations. As we've completely tossed them aside as unimportant. Um, So, I want to talk about levels of intimacy, like I said, with the, with the courts. It, you had the outer courts into the innermost courts into the Holy of Holies. I mean, that's just, like, that's just like our prayer lives. We have levels of intimacy with God. There's, there's corporate prayer. Any prayer with your family, you should be having that. Uh, and then there's individual prayer. And it's kind of like that, that same image from the temple where you're getting closer and closer to God each, each step. Um, now, I don't want us to think that 
that corporate prayer is not important because it's on the outside, because it's the least intimate way to connect with God. You know, the Gentiles might have been on the furthest, furthest part of the temple, but they were just as important enough for Jesus to do something radical. So understand that, that when we come together as a body, it is meaningful. This is a meaningful time, and Jesus is the king of prayer, and Jesus, Jesus has ordained it this way. For us to, be, to come together and to, to honor that. Um, so, so Jesus confronted this activity, and he purified his temple from the, out, from the outside in. That if the outermost court is sacred to Jesus, then we just have to assume that every, everywhere inside of that is just as sacred, so, if not more. So, so I really encourage this, this congregation to really not forsake coming together as a body, to not take that lightly, coming together and praying together and uh, seeking God's face, um, and also to really hold to high, a higher standard just seeking God in our families and in individually on our own too um, so all in all I just want to like talk about what Jesus has really done by flipping these tables I think there's we can apply this to two different attitudes um, in the church number one is um, our attitude of partnership because um, Jesus's concern is for is for prayer um, but you know Sacrifices are still part of the worship service. Sacrifices are still important to God. Um, so I want to talk about partnership, um, especially in, in the terms of the church because, because the temple has been destroyed. You know, there's no more temple. Um, actually, it's Jesus had to, Jesus actually replaced the temple sacrifice. Like him coming to die on the cross, that's, he's being the ultimate sacrifice um, the Jews couldn't grasp a, a Messiah that would die, that would have to die. Um, you know, they were content with their system, their animal sacrifice system, but it wasn't good enough. They would, you know, in God's plan, there was going to be a time when there, we wouldn't rely on that animal sacrifice system, and we needed Jesus. So, but still, we, we do offer offerings to the Lord, um, not for, not for, repentance of sin, but just out of love and worship. So um, in terms of partnership, now that we are the temple of God, not, not, the, not the building, not the walls, not the pews, us, we are the temple of God. Um, therefore, I want to just clarify, there's not meant to be any distinction between us and the church. So many times when I, when I encounter people in the world at work, um, or just out and about, I mean, one of their biggest complaints about church is that the church is always asking for money from us. Um, now, we, we are a church where we don't really, we don't highlight the offering, really. We don't, we're not about that. We're not about taking from people. We're here, we are always giving to people. And if anything, we bring that out a little too less, <laughs> but if there's a way to error, that would probably be the way that I would prefer, right? Um, but some people think that, you know, it's us in the church. I go to church and they want something from me. You are the church, so we can't be extorted or robbed from ourselves. <laughs> um, let me put it this way. The church's financial burdens and the church's goals are our goals. They're our burdens. <laughs> you, we want to meet in a building. The building's going to be here for us as long as we want to meet in the building. If we really want to meet in the building, we'll pay the bills. <laughs> it's not the church robbing us of anything. That's, this is our building. Well, borrowed space right now, but we want a building. <laughs> you know, it's the pastor's job to cast a vision of what God wants to do in this community. It's the pastor's job to do that. Whether or not it gets done is up to us. 
oh, the church wants money for this, the church wants money for that. The question is, do you co-sign that? And if not, why not? The question is, are you a part of that? Is that something that you're about? Are we going to reach the lost? Does it take money? Sometimes it does. Not all the time. I really like the times that it doesn't. Um, honestly, my, my financial situation in my family, you know, I'm, we're, we're expecting a child and, and we're still recovering from, you know, financial issues. And we're stretched thin. And it hurts me that I can't contribute to that building fund right now. That's just where I'm at. It hurts me. Now, whether or not we get a building, if we do, I know it's not because of anything that I put into the pot. And that's, that's just like, oh, man, I wish I could have contributed. If we don't, like, it's not like God's looking down on me like I'm, like I'm not worthy of entering into his presence because I'm not giving into that. So the attitude that we have shouldn't be about, you know, I got to give to the church. No, it's the church is doing, we are doing this together. This is what it's going to take together. When we all are able to do it, we'll do it. And until we are able, we won't do it. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, as long as we accept that if we're unable or unwilling to make those sacrifices, it's not, it's not necessarily a sin all the time, depending on I'm not going to just give you a blanket. It's not a sin because you you got to walk with God that you have to work out. But, you know, in good faith, in, in the goodness of your heart, you can't afford to make those sacrifices. Okay, God understands. There's nothing wrong with that as long as we're, we're aware and accept the fact that the church isn't going to move forward until we're able to move forward. And sometimes that takes a financial sacrifice. So... Attitudes of partnership. That's what it is. We're, we're all partners. We're actually partners in the work of God with God himself. That's what the scripture says. Um, but more importantly, he, we can apply this to our attitudes of prayer. And we can say that intimacy with God is meant for everyone. Not, see, this is something that the nation of Israel didn't understand. They didn't live up to what God had wanted for them is that they were to be, you know, they were to be a house of prayer for all nations. They were to be a light to the nations around them. And they were kind of doing their own thing, and they kind of belittled and just minimized the work of the Spirit and the Gentiles. You know, but, but that's not how it is with us. That's not how it is in this church. Outsiders are still welcome with, to be with Jesus in this church. People on the outside are still just as important and just as valuable in God's eyes, and we want to encourage them to come in. Amen? Um, and obviously, I already said these things, but corporate prayer should not be taken lightly. Coming together and likewise deeper levels of intimacy should be taken even more seriously. So Jesus purified his temple, and he's going to purify this church. He's going to purify, I mean, not just this church, but his greater church. Um, but we're partners together with, with Jesus. And so moving on, continuing the story where we left off. Um, so the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes, have you never read out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise? And leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. Now, we are a church that understands that out of the mouths of babes and infants you've declared praise. Because we, we got a lot of them coming. And, and that are already here. So, um, you know, church growth, strategy number one, make babies. So, um, now, I, I know a lot of people r reject the idea of a relationship with a God that demands praise. They, they get so caught up, like, 
if God is so perfect and so so fulfilled in himself, why does he need us to praise him? I'm going to just turn around and turn back on that question and ask you, do you need to be commanded to praise your spouse when they accomplish something that they, they, that they were working for? Um, do you need to be commanded to praise your children when they, when they make the honor roll or when they do well in sports or whatever they're doing? Do you need to be commanded to praise the people that you love? What's wrong with the Lord doing something good in our lives and us returning with praise? What's wrong with that? Look at the context. We have the blind and the lame coming to him in the temple, and he healed them. And everyone's praising God for it. I don't see anything wrong with that picture. Actually, God, bring, in, bring more reasons to praise you. That's what I'm saying, right? <laughs> so, you know, some people want to silence our praise. Some people want to minimize what God is doing in our lives. That's just the truth, is that they want to take what God is doing and just, just toss it under the rug, just sweep it under the rug and just get rid of it and silence us. You know, church, it's time for us to get excited about what God is doing. It's time for us to, to really reach out and just thank God for what he's done already. It's time for us to realize that, you know, he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. It's time. Amen? So, Jesus says, no. Let them come. Let them come. Let them experience God's goodness. And I like, I like that they were criticizing the children for praising. And I, I remember I was actually reminiscing earlier in worship just when I was a child and I was untrained in the word of God and I was uneducated in the word of God. And just my first context of my relationship with God was just that ability to praise. And I remember tugging on my mom and just being like, I'm praising God. And it was the most exciting moment as a child that, like, I can really look back to. Um, it's just, you know, standing in church and praising God and going to children's church and getting Bible books and getting a present with my Bible books and then my mom accusing me of stealing some toys from church. So <laughs> I remember the day like it was yesterday. <laughs> um, <laughs> But it was just, it's just so awesome just to praise God and, and really like, legalism says that God commands us to praise him. Like he's some self-absorbed dictator. But relationship says that God wants to give us something to praise him about. Amen? So Jesus is, um, you know, Jesus is the king. He's the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. And, and he has so much to fulfill in our lives. And so I want to encourage us, church, just to stand on his promises, to stand on those promises that God has given you and to meditate on them, to think about them, to write them down, to put them in your, put them in your Bibles, to put them in your phones, to uh, you know, put them on your refrigerator, put them out, just like meditate on them, keep them in your heart. Um, you know, God has promises for this church. You know, so many times that God has is, God is, um, given us words that we're going to, you know, have a building, a, a space of our own where we can really just be effective. Amen? Um, you know, we need to stand on those promises. And, you know, when someone, when you, when you start to have doubts and then someone starts to, be, you know, shadow those doubts and be like, you're right, you'll never make it. You know, you just got to tell those people to get out of town. Just get out. Get out. I don't, I don't have time for that. Um, seriously. Um, but he's also, and he's also the king of prayer, so we really need to cultivate that intimacy with him. And I don't know, maybe you don't feel like, like God wants you. Maybe, maybe some people don't feel like that God wants to invite them in, but he really does. 
that you are a priority, that, you know, we as a church, we don't want your money, we want you. <laughs> and and when, when we use money, it's only just to reach out to people and be, invite them in. So, and it's all because we want to have intimacy with God, not just for ourselves, but we want everyone to share in that relationship with God. Amen? Um, and, you know, and he's the king of praise, so let's just praise him, and let's praise him because he's done something good. Amen?